Hey, it's time for TV Skywriter. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to TV Skywriter. I'm Pat Murray, your host. I ordinarily uh, do the Durham Skywriter, this Durham, North Carolina's online community paper. But tonight, I'm doing TV Skywriter, first show of the year, 2017, with a childhood friend, Carolyn Wilkins, who by day is an instructor at the Berkeley College of Music, and by night, She's an, wait a minute, you're an author, but when do you have time to be a jazz musician? <laughs> well, now you're getting to it. I, I think we cannot even go by day or by night. I think we just have to say I do a number of things all, hopefully not all at the same time, but in rapid sequence. There you go. But what we're going to do tonight, we're concentrating on this. Uh, yeah. Marjo for Murder, the <laughs> second installment of the Bertie Bigelow Mystery Series. Yes. Congratulations for having published this, Carolyn. Well, thank you. Well, before we talk about this, tell us, if you don't mind, um, if you could hold up your first novel. Now, let me remind the folks while you're reaching for the book that actually Carolyn has written a textbook book for seniors who sing with bands and also a couple of uh, family like autobiographical family history type books, which are really fabulous. Here it is. This is called Tips for Singers. This book is from Hal Leonard Press, uh, which is a very uh, large music publisher. They publish a lot of, um, you know, music textbooks. And it's a book uh, aimed at what I would describe as the general market, um, someone who's maybe either a high school student or a relative beginner, and they want to know a little bit about what it takes to really be a singer in a band, some basic tips on sort of musicianship, reading and writing music, how to make your arrangements, how to get your band together, how to conduct your rehearsals, what to do if you get nervous during the show, and um, how to publicize your event. So it's kind of um, just what the title is, tips. Okay, give us one tip. So give us one tip that a singer should know um, who is accustomed to just singing, like just singing with the radio or singing in church, and the difference difference between that and singing with the band? Just give us one tip, I'm just curious. That is a brilliant question. And yes, that is what the book is all about. So when you sing just kind of either by yourself or um, with a very sort of organized format like a church or something like that, you usually just comfortable with just doing whatever you do and not worrying too much about having to coordinate it with other people around you and the whole thing for singers and this is uh comes sometimes as a big shock for people who are kind of beginners is that you do have to take into account these other people that are playing with you they need to know how fast you're gonna sing what key you're gonna sing in so it's the whole skill of learning how to coordinate and work with other people. And that is a big part of what that book is about. Well, there's nothing funnier than watching a singer to start singing and then watching the musicians fumble to figure out what key it's in. That's right. That's right. And that used to be, I think, kind of the standard idea of uh, a singer was someone who was maybe not musically that knowledgeable about keys or tempos and just sort of launched in and there was a whole breed of sort of musicians who were adept at knowing how to coordinate with that kind of person but mm -hmm. now with the rise of music colleges like berkeley where i teach and there's a lot of online programs there are a lot of camps there's just a lot more information out there for singers than there used to be. Um, so there's a lot more knowledgeable kind of people out there. Um, and that kind of behavior is, I think, uh, hopefully will sort of go out of fashion. Now, 
Let's talk about Bertie Bigelow. All righty. Okay. This is the second in the series. Do you happen to have the first one on hand? I do. The first one, ta-da, was called Melody for Murder. And um, this was the book that kind of introduces Bertie Bigelow and her friends. And for those of you who maybe didn't read the first one, it tells you a little bit about Bertie. She's a choir director. She lives on the south side of Chicago. Um, she's very uh, both involved with her students because she loves teaching, but also I think extra involved with them because her husband has just recently died and she's a little bit lonely and a little bit lost and she focuses a lot on her teaching and on her friend Ellen who's kind of her best friend and Bertie kind of a soft-spoken quiet kind of shy person is sort of forced to come out of her shell by a number of circumstances that happen first with her student and then with her friend. And before she knows it, she's in the middle of a, a murder investigation. So that That's is- It's a great book and a really fun read. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And it's also fun because it's based in Chicago. Both of us, neither of us are living in Chicago right now. It's our hometown. Respective hometown. <laughs> That's right. And we still consider it our hometown. Isn't that true? Even though oh, yeah. we haven't lived there for years, right? What happens, don't, well, don't tell us everything, but um, the general gist of Mojo for murder. And I love the typeface and the design too, by the way. It's beautiful. The design was brilliant. I, I will talk about the story in a minute, but I do want to give a just tip of the hat to my publisher, um, Duke and Kimberly Pennell, uh, who published, my publishing company is called, uh, their publishing company is called Pen L P E N dash L. And they did just a fabulous job with the cover everything about the book. It looks great. I like to think it reads great. It's been well edited. It's just everything about the presentation, I think, is very professional. Um, so the story, um, Bertie Bigelow, as I say, she's a choir director on the south side of Chicago. She's recently widowed, and she's trying to kind of navigate her way a little bit in the dating game. She has a crush, if you want to call it that, on um, a guy who's a family friend, but he is unfortunately married, but his marriage is not going well, and he leans on her for support, and they're very good friends, and she does kind of think, well, if only you know, but at the same time, you know, she's a very ethical person, so she's certainly not going to um, initiate anything, uh, but yet she yearns a little bit. And meanwhile, there are a couple of other males on the scene as well. And um, yeah, as the story begins, her big uh, drama is that one of her very good friends, uh, Mabel Howard, who's uh, the wife of a big restaurateur in town who owns uh, Charlie Howard's Hot Links Emporium. He makes barbecue, hot links, stuff. His wife is kind of what we would call sort of a new age girl. She's one of these people. She's a sucker for anything tarot, astrology, crystals, any of that kind of new agey stuff. And she's begun seeing a new psychic, but the new psychic tells her that her husband's restaurant has been hexed and that something bad is going to happen. And that is the way the story opens. And Mabel turns to Bertie, knowing that Bertie is a person of solid good sense and a very practical, grounded person, she turns to Bertie and says, oh my goodness, this has happened, it's the hex, it's horrible, what am I going to do? And that is how the story begins. I would say it's probably, um, she, she solves the mystery in book one is kind of over Christmas, and 
The next one takes place uh, the following fall. So it starts, uh, it's around October when, when this one begins. So I want to say it's about an additional nine or ten months later. Do you think she has built a reputation as a, not a detective, but a, a seeker of the truth, so to speak? Or do you oh, think that's, that's a great way to put it, a seeker of the truth? Yeah, I, I would say that people certainly took notice after she foiled a criminal. Uh, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler alert to say that uh, she ends up catching the bad guy at the end to the surprise of everyone. And I think even maybe a little bit to her own surprise, because mm -hmm. previous to this, she had never done anything like this. But it turns out she's kind of good at it. She's very practical. She's very down to earth. And all her years of teaching um, experience have given her a very good sense for people, what they're up to when people are telling the truth when they're not. So she hasn't really acquired necessarily a full-blown reputation, but certainly her friends are aware that Birdie is a person you can go to when you have a problem and she's going to be able to come up with some kind of answer for you. Cool. I'm, I'm going to do what they do on NPR. And I'm going to ask you, to, if you don't mind, I was really enthralled from the beginning because instead of starting out, you know, a lot of stories, especially back in the day, they start out with the person getting up. And then, of course, the way to describe how they look was facil facilitated by the person looking in the mirror mm. and brushing their teeth and getting coffee. <laughs> you know, but your book starts out, boom. So if you could read like just the first page. Oh, sure. Um, yes. Uh, and I will say. I'm asking you an NPR voice. Would you mind just off? <laughs> All right. I would be honored. I, <laughs> I shall read my first page. So chapter one, Friday, October 13th, noon. Something terrible is going to happen, Mabel Howard said. She slid into the red plastic booth across from Bertie Bigelow and frowned. You've got to help me. Take a deep breath, Bertie replied. In her 10 years running the music program at Metro Community College, Bertie had soothed more than her share of nervous people. Slow down and tell me the whole story from the beginning. I don't have time to go back to the beginning, Bertie. Charlie's restaurant has been hexed. Sister Destina says the curse will take effect in six hours. Mabel Howard, a bone thin woman with a nut brown complexion, tore at her napkin with exquisitely manicured fingers. Bertie sighed inwardly. Mabel was sharp as a tack most of the time. But when it came to anything involving psychics, astrology, tarot cards, or past lives, the woman was a total fanatic. Let me get this straight, Bertie said. You went to see a psychic, and now you think your husband's restaurant has been cursed? Sister Destina is not just any psychic. She's a spiritual genius, Mabel said. Of course, she's not really a woman. Technically speaking, sis Sister Destina is a man, but with a lot of yin energy. He was a woman in his last two lifetimes. <laughs> so that's the first page. I love that. That is so good. And then the story takes off from there. and It's really a fun read. Good, good, good. I'm really I'm glad you liked it. I had fun writing it, I have to say. So you read out loud the way that um, a really good storyteller expresses. You know, when you see a, a good storyteller reading to children or, mm. or expressing themselves through words and whatnot, mm. was... So did you be did you know you had this talent as a child or did you discover this storytelling 
talent um, after you wrote your first novel? Because after all, you started out writing nonfiction. That's true. Um, I think uh, what it is is that this particular ability comes from all my years as a performer, right? As a singer, mm. as a performer, you know that in order to engage your audience, you have to, there are certain things that have to happen, and you have to present with a certain amount of energy and a certain kind of um, presentation above and beyond just reading the thing. So I think that actually comes from my performing experience. Um, the story, of course, comes from, you know, the storytelling part, but the delivery is a whole other thing. Okay. Now, like all mysteries or all good mysteries, you have stories that seem to end here and then take side trails over here and then <laughs> they cross paths. And how does an, I, I've never written fiction, I always wondered, how does a mystery writer keep track of all the loose ends and weaving them through the story? Do you keep some kind of a map or an outline? You know, that's a great question. Some writers do do that. Um, what I do is before I actually write the book, I sit down and write uh, an outline of what's going to happen so I know what's going to happen. And I try to sort of each almost blow by blow, chapter by chapter, what's going to happen next what's going to be revealed next, uh, how do I need to bury a clue that's important, but you know, where am I gonna cover it up? So I do my actually make a pretty detailed outline of, of what it's going to be. And the major, I wanna say, borrowing from music, the major notes that I'm gonna hit in each chapter what is going to unfold in the story so that the reader is kept, you know, engaged um, and drawn from chapter to chapter. That's the goal. So for you, your style is that you know what's going to happen. I, do. I, I, I mean, I know that some writers, they say they wait for the characters to speak to them and tell them where they want to go. Right. And that sounds kind of scary in a way <laughs> your, your way sounds a lot neater well i think it depends what what style you're writing if you're writing a mystery i think a mystery has because it's so complex and the thing that you just alluded to which is it has so many pieces it has so many moving parts um my characters do as i'm writing come alive and sometimes they do veer off where my original plan was. Sometimes they insist on saying or doing other things. And then I do try to kind of take note, and it may mean that I need to go back and retweak my original plan if the thing that I've written uh, feels uh, intrinsic, you know, and genuine enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I'll be like, well, okay, maybe I need to do that. But basically, the basic structure, which is the mystery, it's all about structure. Um, mm -hmm. I, I pretty much stick to the structure that I have in mind. They may suddenly burst out with different words or they may make little side trips, but I try to keep them pretty much in the structure because otherwise it's too hard for me to keep track of all the threads that have to come together in order for the reader to be satisfied. You know, mm -hmm. I don't personally like to read a mystery where at the end of it, I go, well, wait a minute, what happened to that character that you had? The, well, wait a minute, didn't you tell me that this, I need to have, I'm one of these people that likes it all tidied up at the end. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so that I, being the one case. What you don't have is the James Baldwin syndrome, yeah. which is you're sailing along reading a beautiful story by James Baldwin, and then he'll say, and then he. So <laughs> he, he <laughs> uh, 
He does that a lot. I don't even notice that. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, he'll, he'll allude to somebody. You don't even know who he's talking about. Yeah. But your characters are easy, easier to follow. Now, I'm not putting down James Baldwin. He's one of my favorite writers of all time. Exactly. But it's just every now and then he'll confuse yeah. me. Yeah. No, this is a far more. And maybe if James Baldwin had written a murder mystery, which I do not believe he did, uh, he would have gone for a more. This is a very much more stripped down kind of functional. It's not high art. It's kind of, you know, much more like reading the newspaper than it is, you know, great art like that. I don't know. It seems pretty artful to me. But oh, good. Speaking of which, okay, in keeping it real, it is based on the south side of Chicago. That's right. And, you know, you're, the, the school is, is of course, fictitious. Metro Community College. Sounds, it's probably Kennedy King College, I'm, I'm it, guessing. It's in that zone for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, on one hand, you mentioned the Chicago Sun-Times, which is, of course, a major daily newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, when you had um, the news report on television, of course, you had a fictitious name for the reporter, but you said Channel 4. And I'm wondering, uh -huh. what, what was the reasoning behind that? You know, I didn't want to... let people know, we have Channel 5 in Chicago. Right. Channel 4, we don't have a Channel 4. Exactly. I'm curious, I actually decided to use a fake channel. I consciously chose a channel that is not a real channel. And and I'm not sure, you're right, I chose a real newspaper and a fake channel. That is true. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure why I, why I did, I just felt like I didn't want it to be too, um, like to someone read it and go, wait a minute, there's no such and such on channel, but, but then I have a real TV channel later in the story. So okay. I don't okay. know. I, 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 that it, that's an anomaly. You're I, I was actually thinking that the reason you had done that was because you did have the name of a reporter mm -hmm. and that you didn't want people to really start looking for this person. That is true. WMAQ TV channel five. That's, that's what I was guessing. Yep. No, that is the reason. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's such a fun read. And oh, like you said, you mapped it out. Um, you how long how long did it take to read to actually write this? Because I'm wondering, because it's a mystery, even though it's outlined carefully, I'm wondering if you took too much time off to play, you know, I know you're you're doing your jazz gigs, you're doing your mm -hmm. your instruction in, in um at the Berkeley College of Music. Um mm -hmm. If you if you spent too much time away from it, would even you get confused? Um, yes, I find once I actually really start writing, I, it's better for me if I can keep my head in it uh, and write it in a concentrated spurt so that I keep all the threads fresh in my mind. Um, yeah. I, that's true. And I think this particular one, my recollection is that I wrote most of the real writing of it, I wrote over the summer, last, mm -hmm. last summer. Okay. Would you say that it was easier because we, hopefully, most people who read Mojo for Murder <laughs> um, also um, read Melody for Murder, right. where the characters are... I mean, you do reintroduce us. You don't have to um, to have read the first book to to enjoy the second. That's but right. because the characters are already established, at least some of them, mm -hmm. did you find the second book easier to write than the first? You know, that's a great question. I would say, actually, I found the second book more difficult to write mm -hmm. because there was already a pre-established template. I cannot, Bertie cannot change. She can change a little bit, but she can't change, you know, she can't suddenly be six feet tall or, you know, have dreadlocks or what. I mean, she could, but she, she, her personality has been kind of established. And each one of those characters 
they're they're established and I, they can vary a little bit of course we hope they grow and evolve but in another mm -hmm. way they're kind of set and people who read huh. and enjoyed melody for murder would be very disappointed if for example her best friend ellen who's very prone to afrocentric clothing and likes to wear the head wrap and the Ghanaian dress and all that, if she were to suddenly, you know, fall out in, you know, hip hop attire or something, I think people would be upset because it wouldn't fit their image. So on the one hand, it's easier. And on another hand, it's, it's a little bit more exacting. Hmm. I would never have thought that. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense though. Yeah. Yeah, makes perfectly good sense. Yeah. So we have maybe one minute left. Okay. So, so Carolyn, why don't you tell us how we can find both books, Melody for, for Murder and Mojo for Murder. <laughs> so you can find my books at Amazon.com. I think that's probably the best thing. If you visit my author page, Carolyn Marie Wilkins, if you type that in in Amazon, it'll take you to my author page. I have two also works of nonfiction that I wrote earlier. If you like reading memoirs, I have two memoirs there. And then I have Melody for Murder, Mojo for Murder. And if you're a singer, um, I have my textbook there as well. Wonderful. One last question. Mm -hmm. Will there be a third Birdie <laughs> Big Love Mystery? Yes, there will. I yes. think um, I've already kind of got a few ideas. I can't say that I've actually started writing it, but I have started putting some ideas together. And uh, I'm hoping that it will continue uh, with the same kind of M theme. There's Melody, there's Mojo, and the other one will also have an M title as well. <laughs> Interesting. Thanks so much, Carolyn, for being on the show. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. So this time next year, we'll be talking about your third. Oh, lovely. I hope so. So we'll, uh, not, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, sure, Carolyn. Okay, folks, I do hope that you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to be a guest on TV Skywriter, just write to me, DurhamSkywriter at gmail.com. And with that, everybody's snowed in um, here in Durham, North Carolina. So I expect everything's closed tomorrow. So I'll just use that as a work day um, in finishing up the Durham Skywriter, which is Durham, North Carolina's online community paper, DurhamSkywriter.com. With that, have a great evening, and I'll see you guys later. Ciao for now. <laughs>